Awesome. Hey guys, thanks so much for being here today um, and joining us on the Malou Project uh, to talk about current events and how we can work together through these things um, as a group. Uh, Malou Project is a nonprofit to get girls into aviation. We really think that that creates a lot of opportunity for, for girls and women and children uh, that would not otherwise have access to those things to learn about themselves and, achieve, and gain some skills and, and, uh, and confidence in areas. Uh, in that regard though, the reason it's called Malou, I mean, you can see it, is because Malou is a French word for environment, social environment. Uh, and so it just fits into this dialogue, we think, to talk about those things uh, and help those same girls that we want to get into aviation and to process what's going on. So I really appreciate everybody being here. It takes a it takes a community, right? It's not just an individual thing. And, and really, I think that we'll, we'll all grow together through this um, conversation and through uh, this discussion. So uh, with that prep, I wanted to hand this over to Carrie since, uh, since she just came back from, from speaking to some girls that were of the age group that we're, we're looking at to target in the Lou Project. We really want to help. Carrie, over to you. Hi everybody, it's nice to meet you. Uh, as Jen mentioned, the Malou Project, we're, we're aiming at trying to find ways for girls to experience these skills that you gain through aviation because they're valuable. It's a unique challenge to learn how to fly an airplane and we feel they're transferable to the other, other environments you might find yourself in life as far as critical thinking and problem solving. And it's gonna be something that helps them as they grow their wings, as we're trying to say, grow her wings. So, so they already have that strength and that knowledge within them. It's, it's getting them to really continue to grow and feed what's inside of them to be able to grow into just successful, unbelievable women that we know they can be. And one of the reasons we discussed with, with the Malia Project, with it being the idea of your social environment, we like to say, be the change, change your Malou. Uh, the events of the last few months I know it's, it's different how everybody's seen things. And I don't wanna say just the last few months, if you were to talk to my family, we would talk over the last 30 years. And for my sister specifically, how her experience has changed over the last 19 years since being married to her husband, who is originally an immigrant from Ghana. And I apologize if I have to pause every once in a while because I'm trying to co collect my thoughts before I get too, too emotional. Because for me, it's a very emotional feeling. So we wanted to discuss, you know, how, how, how this makes you feel. What are the, the, these events? How has it made you feel? What were your thoughts? What did you want to do? And just coming back from visiting with my nieces, um, for a perspective, one is 16. So she's already dealing with the challenges of being a teenager. The other is 12. She's just dealing with the challenges of being her. Because if you were to ask them, you know, about the last few weeks and few months of things that they've seen both on the news or through social media, you'll get two completely different answers. Uh, the 16 year old watches how the world treats her father and has reactions and emotions to that, which is in turn feeding her perceptions and her beliefs and her feelings and how she discusses how she identifies as a young black woman growing up in the United States, specifically right now in Boise, Idaho. Uh, Willie, I think you had said it earlier, we've made it almost too difficult or impossible in some environments to have these conversations. We're either using, whether it's through word choice, and Brendan, you mentioned it a little bit earlier before we started, that we carry it further. So if we take it too far, then we can't identify with each other to continue the conversation. So for me, what I'd, I'd like to hear, what I'd like to see to get out of this is how do we have those conversations about something who for me is emotional. Uh, for my sister and her family, it's, it's life that they're, they're living right now and trying to learn how to move forward and have these conversations with a 16 and a 12 year old. And just your family who might feel they, they mean well, but they're not getting it. And some of their well-meaning phrases, like telling their 16 and 12 year old granddaughters, I don't see you as black, I just see my granddaughter. Sounds wonderful. But educating them, that conversation to have with them of why that isn't so helpful of a way to approach it. 
So thanks for letting me go on my long introduction and explanation. But that's why I feel it's important to have this conversation, why it nests so well with the Malou project as far as changing, changing the environment, being that change that we want to see in the world. Awesome. So uh, I wanted to kind of give everybody an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, Brendan, I'm going to start with you since this kind of was your idea uh, that I cap I'm capitalizing on and, and making happen. Um, I'm glad that you're able to be here today uh, to help us with, uh, with this, this idea that you had. So if you could start and then uh, Ryan, Rashad, and then Willie. So over to you, Brennan. Okay, well, uh, Jen, Carey, thanks for, for pulling this together, uh, for making this into a a vehicle and avenue that it can be uh, for pulling together the group of us um, from uh, the, the introductions and uh, just talking beforehand. It's it sounds like a uh, a diverse background, um, and even with the diversity, though, we each bring a level of uh, uh, respect to the discussion, which is what you intended. It's by design, so uh, much appreciated for that. Um, I, um, I'm a father, um, a, you know, husband, um, I, um, I'm really more of an introvert, so I try to avoid conversations, um, that draw a lot out of me because it's draining. Um, but this has been, it's been a uh, different, um, and, uh, it sparked something, uh, it sparked a very different response from me than that it surprised me initially. And I think that's one of the, you know, some of the, the questions that you may have later, so I won't go too into it. But um, I, I'm just, I'm appreciative for this, this venue uh, to be able to talk with, um, uh, I, I feel comfortable in saying like minds, although we may, may differ in opinion, uh, but like-minded in the respect of uh, we care about uh, people. Uh, and thank you. Awesome, Brennan, thank you. Uh, Ryan, you and I talked a little bit the other day, uh, and your experience during the Rodney King riots, I think, helped your, get your perspective um, as you make your introduction, if you don't mind just kind of speaking a little bit about your background and um, just a little bit of your introduction, please. Yeah, how's it going, everyone? Um, I, I'm honored to, to be invited to the conversation. I told Jen, uh, I'm not sure um, why she thought of me, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss things. And as, she's, as she knows, I'm, I, I engage a lot with people uh, on how they approach thoughts and ideas. And, and that's really what I enjoy is to help analyze and understand. You know, it helps me understand where someone else comes from. Uh, and so I really try to put myself in other people's shoes. And so I grew up a military brat. My my dad was in the Air Force. He's an Academy grad as well and spent the first you know, nine of my first 14 years of my life in California. And in particular, five of those in Southern California just happened to be uh, during the uh, Rodney King riots and, and all that fall on. So I got a, a, a perspective real young um, of, of what was going on. And my school um, was kind of, it was new on military base, so it was on military base. And so it had quite a, a mix of diversity and um, so it was, a, it was a really unique experience for me to kind of see that. And then I went straight from there to, to you know, suburbia Colorado Springs for middle school uh, and where it was 99% uh, uh, white America. And then my last two years of high school, I moved to the deep south, uh, you know, north, northern Panhandle, Florida, if you will. And it was, it was, you know, three very, very different cultures uh, that kind of shaped uh, my perspective on the world as they went back to the uh, Air Force Academy. But again, glad to participate. Hopefully I can um, add some value to this conversation. I'm here to learn and I look forward to it. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. Rashad, I know you were not into this idea at first, um, but I'm glad we had a phone call. It was so great to hear your voice when we did talk. And, uh, and I'd love you to give some of your background and, and information to share with us. Well, hopefully we'll be, thank you. First of all, thank you. And I'm, and I'm happy to do this, Jen. Um, I, I just, uh, we'll talk about it probably momentarily anyway, but I think the, my reasons were, um, I just didn't want to be in another conversation where I had to defend 
reality. Um, and and it, it, for me, I wasn't interested in a debate um, anymore. I think I'm kind of, I've spent my life sort of uh, looking for significance and validation. And I, I didn't want this to be yet another traumatic experience where um, we were using something that happened that is a clear violation of human rights um, to turn that into uh, a moment where I have to now defend my blackness, my Americanness, my humanity, my patriotism, my understanding of history, my understanding of life, my ability to see and perceive. I didn't want to do that. And so I appreciated our conversation to help us get there. Get there. Um, I'm actually, I have a very similar background uh, to Ryan, although for very different reasons. I'm not a military brat. Um, uh, none of my none of my parents before I graduated from college had had attended any kind of um, uh, university whatsoever, and so um, my experience. I actually grew up in Southern California primarily early in my life as well. I left when I was twelve years old. Um, I was in Southern California, all over the Inland Empire, but primarily in LA and in, in South Central. So. When I happened to move to Arkansas, Fort Smith, Arkansas, a very different place from LA, <laughs> um, uh, the deep south in the in the you know late eighties and early nineties, um, you know before Walmart actually decided to hire and bring people into Northwestern Arkansas it was just, in fact, uh, Mountain Home Arkansas and Rogers Arkansas at that time was the uh, they were the head, national headquarters for the Ku Klux Klan. And so, which is that I had never heard of the Ku Klux Klan um, until my stepfather's mother gave me this whole rundown about, you know, you got to watch out for the Ku Klux Klan, which sounded like, I, I mean, it, I thought it was like a, a group of like, you know, local terrorist hero villains kind of a thing. Like, I thought this was comic book stuff. Um, and then, you know, I quickly found out uh, through a series of experiences that, no, this, this is very real and there are are adult human beings who have made a determination that they don't want um, even children who uh, don't look like them in their space whatsoever, even though I question the word there. Um, but I grew up in both places and um, came to love both for different reasons. And then also had a, an opportunity to go to the Air Force Academy. I say I was kind of forced there is the best decision that my mother ever made for me, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, and, and it's been, it's been a, a ride ever since. I was a communications officer in the, in the Air Force. I think it's called Cyber Warfare now, much cooler title than what I was in. And, um, you know, when I got out, I had an opportunity to stay in the DC area and continue to work in the intelligence community. So I've done a lot of government services work. Uh, always been an entrepreneur as well. I spent most of my time at the Air Force Academy making rap music in my room and then selling that to cadets. Ryan, I may know you if I sold you a CD. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's kind of been my life. So I eventually started a, started a few companies and, um, and it's, been a, it's been a wild ride. I've had some fun with that, but the beauty right now is I think I get to be mentally free because whether it's COVID or what have you, I typically work from, this is work from home, it's my office. Um, and I get to control my time, I control for the most part, what financial resources I have access to. And I've been blessed to be um, financially much better off than my parents before me. And so that's afforded me different opportunities, but that, that has also led to me seeing the world in a much different way and wanting to ensure that my own son and daughter have free reign of the world, um, just like all children do. And, and so the, there, all of these things have affected me over time, but I've always sort of prided myself on focusing on what's important and just working hard and pushing through it. But I got to tell you the image of Eric Chauvin's uh, knee on George Floyd's neck, I couldn't get it out of my, I, could, I couldn't sleep. And that's the first time that's ever, like I couldn't, I couldn't let that go. And I personally hit a point where I was, I was just, you know, fed up. Um, no, and Jen, that was me saying no time for talking. I'm all about action. Um, I was deeply angry, and I know we'll talk about some of those things, but that's a, an introduction to Rashad. That's awesome. Thank you for being here, Rashad. All right, Willie, you're finally up on video. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, Rashad, for taking an extra 30 seconds so I can make Good. it upstairs. But uh, 
Yeah, Willie Allen, um, my experience kind of like Rashad and Ryan, been all over. My dad was a Marine, so from uh, California, Hawaii, primarily elementary school uh, experience in North Carolina, Eastern Carolina, which is pretty much the deep south as well for high school, middle school, and college. So um, my, and, and again, I thank you, Jen, for allowing me to be a part of this. And you guys will find that my perspective and outlook on life, even with the same experiences as so many others in this country, is a little different. And so I just want to bring that perspective and my way of thinking and how I like to see the good in, in, in what's ahead uh, versus focusing on the negative. Uh, not to discard it, but just really try to talk about how can we move forward um, with the lessons from the past. And like you, Rashad, it is disgusting, but I'm a big fan. Let's focus on the individual and not what we see on the surface. Uh, when I say that, um, discussions I like to have, like Ryan, you try to really Give, try to find a different perspective. Uh, right now, I'm discussing things in our office, in our headquarters, when it comes to diversity. I'm trying to come up with a way to get people away from just looking at it skin deep. Um, because like for you guys that grew up in South uh, Central LA, you may look like me, but my experience is, as you know, somebody from the South is gonna be totally different, somebody from the Northeast. So, um, so we just, I just, I'm a big fan of when it comes to diversity, let's look at more than just the skin deep. It's, it's, it's necessary because that's what the country is. We do have things that um, are physically different and we will acknowledge that, but that should not be our focus. At least that's the way I see it. And I would love to get different thoughts and maybe add some tools to my uh, tool bag. And again, thank you for the beer. Awesome. All right, all. Well, thank you so much. Brennan, it looks like you switched to a picture there of uh, yourself speaking. It's pretty wonderful. Um, okay, so the first question that we had to just kind of help us out with starting uh, is just, you know, the events of the, it was last week when we put out those pictures or the, the, um, the prep, but really on May 26th, you know, we saw those things. Like, I know some people have talked about it in their introductions. Uh, Rashad, thank you so much. Um, but, you know, for some of the other folks that are here on the panel today, how did that, like, what did that stir for you? What feelings did you have? I know that I was upset about just the, the, the fact that that was even happening, that a police officer was even able to do that in broad daylight. It, that was my personal, like, I, I just can't even believe this is going on. It's on film and that uh, there's nobody doing anything about it. Uh, I think some of you saw that I posted on Facebook, like, if I was, if someone, why those people that were standing around didn't, didn't do anything that bothered me a lot um and so that was just my personal experience with it um Carrie if you want to kind of go through what you felt when you saw those those images I would say one of one of the first things is I was I was traveling at the time so unfortunately I get the ability to be blissfully unaware sometimes of what's going on in the United States as I'm as I'm traveling around and it's usually a member of my family that will say did you see this and that event was the first time that I got a message and it was on Instagram and it was from my 16 year old niece and it was the video and her subtitle was this could be my dad so my initial response of watching the video was Anger that this was in broad daylight. Anger that that man's peers, one of them was standing there with his hands in his pocket. And the other, I understand the reason because, I understand the reason for videotaping it because unfortunately, no one got mad till they saw the video of the young man, Ahmaud Arbery, running and being chased down and trapped. It had happened a month came out and then people started to get angry so here I'm I don't want to say I'm grateful but this video was out immediately and I was angry I couldn't sleep I couldn't form words my niece wanted me to call her right away I couldn't do it my 16 year old niece is seeing something and she's already trying to form her identity as a young teenager and she sees that when she wakes up and her first thought was that could be my dad so just a lot of anger a lot of just kind of kind of just discuss that as a society we haven't figured a way to move past treating human being with more respect yeah, does anybody else want to i want to open it up now um to anyone else who wants to kind of talk about it 
uh, that kind of feeling that you had or, or reaction or what you wanted to do in that situation. Um, Brendan, Willie, Ryan, Rashad. Okay. I'll go ahead if you don't mind. Um, just like your niece, uh, Carrie, it's disgusting. It, it is disgusting. It's disgusting that there are bystanders, but I understand why there are bystanders, but it is disgusting that his fellow officers pretty much froze. Um, that's where I have the issue. Uh, again, for me, it's one of those things you try not to react emotionally, maybe because uh, I'm a pilot by trade and you got to kind of take things and analyze things as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And then if there's accidents, you have safety boards, you just don't want to jump to conclusions. I know that's not the popular answer, but you just don't want to do it, right? But those other three froze. And that's what makes me upset. I try not to look and see what the guy's skin color was because we know there's other folks who had different uh, skin tones that were police officers there. But the fact of the matter is that this police officer did what he did. Rather, it was malice or rather it was maybe just for eight minutes and 46 seconds, forgot that he was on this person's neck with all his body weight. Regardless of the situation, that's not how they were trained. I'm not a police officer. I'm pretty sure that's not how they were trained. That's not how when somebody's detained, uh, you leave them in that position. Uh, and if they were fearful, which I know that's probably what they're going to say with the crowd uh, uh, are gathering around, they should have uh, picked up Mr. Floyd up, put him in the back of the car, and then went on their merry way. So, yes, you are correct. Your, but your niece, I would say, that's why I tell my boys, I have a 20-year-old who's at West Point or home right now driving us nuts. Um, I'm an 18-year-old who just graduated, and he'll start school. and be going to school in Texas this fall and I have a 13 year old about to start high school. So I tell them the same thing, guys, could, could it happen to me or one of you? Absolutely. Cause there's bad people out there on this earth. Absolutely. It could happen. But I tell them you cannot go around walking around uh, throughout the rest of your life, fearful of certain institutions, certain authorities that you should not fear. You should respect the authority. But you should not fear them. Um, because if you do, then you, they're going to have power over you. If you let people have power over you because of that fear, you're going to have a crappy life, you know? Um, so, yeah, could it have been? Maybe. Because, again, there's more to it than just the video. We see the outcome. Yes, there's bad people. So I'm pretty sure there are cops out there that have done it and will continue to do it. You know, just grab somebody because they don't like them, jack them up maybe, and take their life. But I do not feel that um, – that is the norm. Okay, I do not feel that is the norm because if it was, I'm pretty sure I would not be sitting here, Mr. Howard or Mr. Apps would not be sitting here. We've all had experiences and if we ever have time, I can tell you about mine. It's on um, uh, Janice's scene, uh, a very small portion of some of my experiences. It did involve police officers with guns drawn on me, um, but I'm still here. So uh, I would just, I don't know, there's more to it then the outcome does not warrant his death. Whatever he did, he did not deserve to die. There's no question. But we just cannot walk in fear. And we do need to hold those certain individuals accountable for their lack of concern for human life and, the, and pretty much failing at their job. That we will, I should say I, I agree on. But just because a person was a white police officer who killed a black uh, uh, citizen, that should not be the main focus because let's say it was the Asian cop who did that. Would we be having this issue? Would we be having this discussion? Would we have this outcry? That's, that's what I, that's the question I have. Would we have this outcry? So I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Somebody else want to chime in. So, um, oh, 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 wait a second. No, please go ahead, Brendan. Um, so I, I still have not watched um, the video in its entirety. And, you know, on my phone, it has the, the autoplay for, you know, videos. And I, I stop it. You know, I, I stopped it anytime it would come up and start. Um, for me, it's not something that I'm no I'm I'm not willing to 
watch. Um, uh, and um, initially, it was it, it's for for me. There's there's something very different about um, gun violence versus a um, interpersonal uh, physical violence, where it's you know somewhat of a hand to hand situation. Uh, because with a with a gun, you make a movement, and a you know a bullet fires. There's a reaction, a response, and you don't have time to think about it after the fact. Uh, even firing multiple times, there's a, there's a level of uh, there, there's amount of time that doesn't then that, that uh, it just passes. It passes very quickly. But for something, when you get into interpersonal physical contact, you have the, the, the there's a there's a very personal aspect to that, um, and that was that was uh, challenging for me, um, still is, um, in that incident, um, and I, so since then. It's been, it, it's it's really grown for me, um, because if you if you, if you step back for me as I step back and think, okay, well that's an incident, and a lot of people will try and point to and say, well, you know, by the numbers, by the statistics, by the this is this, but it was never about that incident. Uh, and I've been, I had to pause for a moment because I, I was passionate uh, with someone where it's, it's not about this, it's not about him. Uh, yet there's murals and, uh, you know, discussions about a person. And, and I understand that that was a trigger for a lot of people. But for me, I, I've never been, I've never been at gunpoint. My interactions with uh, being pulled over, I've, you know, and I've told people a number of times, every time I've been pulled over, I was speeding. And it was not like a little bit. Um, and I've either gotten off with a warning or, you know, had my ticket. I didn't challenge it because I knew I was speeding. Um, and uh, in one case, I was very extreme. It took me, you know, a good 20 seconds of, you know, it was six million dollar man motions reaching for, you know, my license. And the officers said, you know, you're behaving a little suspicious. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know what to tell you. I didn't say this, but I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what to tell you. Um, because from what I've seen, what I, what's been perpetuated, I, I'm going to look suspicious to you no matter what. Um, but it's it's the it's the micro frustrations for me of having to always having to wonder, okay, well, how is this going to play out? As opposed to you know other people, you know, cursing the officer out and and you know fighting the ticket and saying throwing it back at the officer. I, I, I'm like that just would never ever occur to me to do and it's it, it's the micro frustrations for me of not having that option to be able to do that not for it because it doesn't occur to me it's the frustrations of being the only person who looks at me in a room meeting after meeting after meeting all day every day at work in some jobs and having to sit and wonder, okay, well, are they dismissing my idea because it's not a good idea, because they just don't like the idea, because they don't like me as a person, or is it something else? And what people don't get a lot of times, and it's hard to communicate because it's it's so uh, it's so just truly ambiguous. Is what I don't like is the not knowing, and what others don't have to deal with is the not knowing. 
it's not that I feel like every time someone disagrees with me, they're being racist or it's because of systemic racism. But when it happens, I don't know. And I can't dismiss it. And it's because of years and years of the actual systemic racism playing out. It's the, the buildup of oppression uh, of the various types. Are we in a better place? Absolutely. Do I walk around, you know, and I, I, I posted, I shared a comment, uh, it was a couple of days after, um, you know, I went out for a walk with my wife and I was wondering, you know, it just crossed my mind, hey, I wonder if one of the new neighbors that we haven't met yet is going to see me walking by myself, see my son walking by himself, riding his bike and call the police or be afraid because, oh, there's someone, you know, there's a threat in the area. And it's not that I walk around in fear every time I go for a walk. And sometimes I go for a walk with the understanding that, you know, hey, it may happen. And I just have to accept that. But it's, but why do I have to accept that? Why is there even the possibility that that may happen? Because I've done everything in my life that I, I try to do everything in my life to live in such a way that I'm not a threatening person. Uh, and part of that is factored in because of the, because of uh, race, because of discrimination, um, because of my perceptions, whether they're real or not. Um, I recognize that I've, I, I changed my tone, diminished my stature. Um, and so with that, with that, um, the release of the video, with the discussions being held, I've been more in a, a place of, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm going to speak more freely in a respectful way, um, uh, because that's just how I was trained by my parents. Um, and that's the right thing to do. Uh, but at the same time, I'm going to allow other people to be uncomfortable. I'm not going to compensate for how someone else feels about what I have to say. Um, and I'm going to allow others to be accountable for their own guilt, their own shame, their own confusion, uh, because I, I've, I, I'm, I'm tired. That's powerful. And, uh, powerful thing. Can I comment on what, particularly the last thing that, that Brendan, Dr. Epps just said? Um, <laughs> um, you realize what he just described was he's tired of not being free to be human. So now he's just going to go ahead and be human. Yes. That's the standard. That's I was going oh, to be brief, not like my long diatribe before, but Brendan, what you just said, and Rashad, your follow-up, and then even Willie with what you said about not giving them the power reminded me of my niece just got her driver's license. And her father started to have the conversation with her of how to behave at a traffic stop. And I was there for it. And he goes, you know what? No, I want you to be you. He goes, I shouldn't have to tell you that you need to act differently than if it's your mom or your aunt or your grandfather or your grandmother getting pulled over. He goes, I know that you might experience prejudice, you might experience racism, but he's decided he's not, he doesn't want to teach her how to act differently. She shouldn't have to act differently. So Brennan, what you just said right there and then Rashad, your follow-up of tired of not feeling free to be human. So he's just going to start being human. That, that's powerful. And I now look at that conversation I saw my brother-in-law having with my niece completely differently. So at first I thought, 
oh man, this is going to be so hard for her growing up. I wasn't looking at the perspective. She shouldn't have to worry about that. So thank you, all of you. Thank you for giving me a new perspective on something that I've witnessed. And Mr. Epps, it, it, in, in your words, I, I can see the hurt and, and frustration. And maybe because I'm five foot four and I have this little man complex that I've always, you know, I can't, I can't, diminish my demeanor or stature any more than what it is. I'm only five foot four. So um, I, I get what you're saying. And I, and I think that like the, one of the pieces that I just kind of put my thoughts together for the Mathos page was I am not a victim. I do not live in fear. Uh, and that, that kind of, and I look at it and I can see how it was kind of poking the bear and, and kind of uh, diminishing some people's experiences. And that was, that was not my intent. It really was, this is how, like you just said, you want to be human and that's how I live life. But at the same time, you know, there's still certain respects for, you know, authorities, whether my parents, you know, police officers, my bosses, whatever the case may be, you know, professors, whatever. Um, I just can't be me all the time, right? You know, inside my four walls, I'm dad or I'm a husband or I'm a friend, whatever. But in certain environments, you know, there's certain behaviors that I think we have to portray. Um, and again, the outcome sometimes does not um, justify, you know, maybe somebody's rudeness. It just doesn't. I, and I will never say it does. Um, but again, you do have certain authorities and some people, and we all know, we all seen them when we're growing up. There are some people, they get a little bit of authority and it goes to their head. And if you disrespect that authority or they perceive it as disrespect, they're going to do whatever it is and, and use that authority for you. I, the prime example is TSA. I can't stand TSA. I cannot stand people at the airport. But I know my behavior is going to change <laughs> at TSA because they can make my day very long and miserable. I hope I'm kind of um, kind of getting that thought across correctly. Again, the outcome won't ever say that person deserved whatever they got. Won't ever say that. Um, but where do we break that chain? In aviation, there's always a chain of events that leads to the, the accident, right? Uh, especially this fatality. And somewhere in that link, Somebody can make a decision to say, all right, let's stop right now. Let's take a break and let's look at this big picture and go, something bad is going to happen. Let's stop, right? So where, I would say, where can we, as those not in that position of authority, you know, Carrie, you say your, your daughter or your uh, niece might get pulled over. I've had to talk to my kids. My parents had it with me. And kind of like with your, um, your brother-in-law, it's like, you be you. But there's a level of respect for that authority because I, my uncle was a, was a police officer, you know, um, and he'll tell you, you don't know what you're going to get in those traffic stops. You just don't know. People are crazy nowadays, right? So a lot of it is they're just going to come fairly cautious. So there is some level of respect that we have to give that authority, regardless of who they are. Um, how do we per, How do we get our younger folks to understand that without giving up? who they are. And I think at least from my experience, that's the challenge, right? You know, that's the challenge. I talk with my hands, but every time I get pulled over, just like you, Brendan, it's because I did something wrong. I got that. I have to admit it. I can't talk with my hands. You know, I purposely try to hold on. One hand has the registration license out the window. The other one's on the steering wheel because I know I like to talk with my hands. Um, is that really giving something up or is that just trying to make their job in their perception, right, a little, make them more relaxed. If I, if I could chime in, uh, I think part of it from my experience too is that, that there is systemic issues at play, you know, and, and whether how you act in those systemic issues or not, you know, that's you know, your personal choices. And I, I'm sad that, that you can't be you. And I hope that, that we do have changes that, that allow all of us to be us. But, you know, it goes back to when I was, I think I was in fifth grade when I saw that Rodney King video for the first time and seeing people rationalize a man just getting beaten, you know, the fifth grader, you, you see what you see, you know, when what people are telling you just didn't make sense. So I knew it was wrong, but I could hear people around me rationalizing it. And of course, there was a bigger discussion in, uh, at my school. And then, you know, as I move on later in life, uh, I ended up back at the Air Force Academy as an as a AOC. Um, and I saw that the system, you know, maybe 
that wasn't necessarily racist per se, but it was stacked against those from low income or you know backgrounds where they're first generation in college because they didn't know the what they had access to when they got into situations at the academy, especially when it came to disenrollment. And unfortunately, those uh, you know that come from poorer backgrounds at the academy tended to be of minorities. And so I saw firsthand the system stacked against people who didn't have the resources or didn't understand the resources at their hand. I think there's, uh, I hope that all of this triggers that bigger conversation. When this, when I first saw the video, I was actually uh, in a in a Facebook debate, which I try to avoid, but uh, about uh, Mr. Cooper, who was in the uh, Central Park, and had the cops called on him because this lady was not happy that he was calling her out on on violating a rule in the park, and and she was using the system uh, to her advantage against him, and so I was, you know, having this argument, you know, with some of my fellow. Uh, pilot friends per se on Facebook trying to say, hey, this is, you know, she is being racist and this is a systemic racist system that she can even use the system to call the cops and have them come down over her confronting him and her coming in his face. Um, and then, you know, and then I saw that video and when I first saw it, I, I, I didn't believe it at first. I was just like, that, is this an old video? Is this something that's just resurfaced because of what's going on in this, this other incident with the Aubrey incident? And then, you know, I think like you all of you said, I was just dumbfounded that that, that could happen. Um, and then with all the, the rights going on, you know, I live in Northern Virginia right now. Um, I had the police call on me for my kid playing in between the townhomes. And it's like the second day of the riots. And I was just like, you know, a cop's guy go out of his day to come talk to me about my kid being too loud. And, and I was like, what if I wasn't a white male? How differently would this have gone based on not only what's going on in the world, but the system at play. And I think that it's a, it's a real conversation because there's a lot of laws, there's a lot of systems that have people that aren't necessarily racist per se, but the system puts them in situations to put power over people who majority could be of uh, a minority background. Um, and I think that's something that we really have to analyze. I think like licensing laws uh, are excessively racist. The, the law, the you know, the licenses you need to have business, you know, they were put in place, you know, 100, 150 years ago to keep white businesses protected. And maybe that's not why we have it now, but we need to have that conversation of what is it doing to, you know, other communities? Is it still a racist system, even if the people aren't necessarily racist running it? I think these are, these are conversations that I hope this all generates, that, that there are a lot of laws, there are a lot of systems or a lot of processes that were born out of racism and we need to deconstruct that and rebuild that so we understand um, where those power positions are because there are people that take advantage of that and one of my master's degree was focusing in on on what control does to people and what power does to people and uh, you know I, I was studying that more in lines with military leadership and how you know leader leaders go bad but it it plays just as well into any position that lords power over people. Uh, just my perspective. So lesson, so you talked about, you know, the laws and why things were years ago, right? My, you know, again, what I try to teach my boys is regardless what the, the motive was back then, Either you play with the system and you make it work to your advantage or you figure out a way to fix the system. Because worrying about what it was and all those things, we can't, we can't go back. We can only go forward. So like you said, Ryan, those laws, whatever those things are that are in place, we need to figure out a way. Do we really, are they, do they, are they necessary now? Uh, can they evolve or do they just need to go, right? Doing business that's we done way back in the day, that's how we always done it. It's the worst excuse I've ever heard, and I can't stand in the Air Force, and we still have people that do it to this day. So let's figure out how we can fix it. If there's laws for licensing, whether it be businesses, yes, you're right. We need to figure out what's required, not what's desired. What is most advantageous for everybody? How can we make it equal? Um, and then let's move forward. Not focus on the blame game, because right now I, I feel, and, I'm, and I may be totally off base on this, but the discussions we're having at the headquarters in junior RTC 
the discussions that I try, like you guys, to avoid on Facebook. But every once in a while, I just have to say something. It's the blame game right now. A lot of these things, and it's not just now. It's I've been dealing with this, at least in the Air Force, since the year 2000. There, there's things I'm still seeing. They're taking surveys and trying to figure out new ways to move forward for diversity and everything else. And it's really just the blame game, and they're not, and they're not trying to move the needle. Okay, so how do we change the mindset of understand there were wrongs? How do we move forward to make them right? Not say we were right or who is right. How can we go forward? to make things right. I don't have that answer. I wish I did. I wish probably all of us wish we had that answer, but I don't know. How do, how do we go forward? Yeah, Willie, I think that what Brennan said, if I can just quickly interject, that you know, being as authentic and coming forward in your humanness, as Rashad said too, and you know, we, when I was at the OTS and working with you, I, the tests, right, the AFOQT, they were finding that the minorities and women, I mean, women were not testing well in, in any regard. And so, you know, just being authentic, like I'll take the AFOQT and, and just being myself and, and show that and then ask the questions, right, that, re that requires us to hold those people accountable that have been in those systems that Ryan's talking about that just kind of blindly like, well, that's just the way it is. Well, no, we, there's, some, there's work we can do here. Um, and challenging that. Um, that's, that's my opinion, but uh, anyone else wants to talk? I think the answer would begin with that, with, it, with acknowledgement first. I, you know, I, I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I tend to do that I, I found was a, a very uh, negative habit this time around was, let's just come up with a solution list real quick. Let's just make it go away. Right. And what um, what was very useful for me this time was deciding to do nothing and understand how I feel right now and to try to put words, put a lexicon around it, to, like, to, to call out what am I feeling? Because I don't want to just go with what everyone else is telling me I'm feeling. I know you're outraged. I know you're angry. I know you're this. No, I, I don't know what I am right now. So taking the time to understand that. So that, so that I can at least put a name to it, call it out, and then begin to have an into like the problem with some of this in solving the problem and moving on is we can't have an intellectual discussion about it because there's one group in the room who's had an intellectual, psychological, sociological, behavioral, life, human experience that also has intellectual components associated with it. And there's another group often that is the authority, the, the final word, um, the historian on law and order, who, who doesn't even acknowledge that this person's feelings or emotions are valuable to the conversation. And so this, this concept of just moving on um, while I understand, because I'm, I'm Mr. Problem Solver myself, I get it, that the concept of moving on and getting to a solution actually exacerbates to some extent the problem if it doesn't begin with a, with a sense of acknowledgement. And then the first education really becomes, okay, so, so what, what, do, what do we all believe? What should we call that? And how do we get here? Um, I, you know, I, I decided, um, I have a bit, one of my business partners is, is white and uh, his name's Terry Rice. Great guy, right? When this happened, I was just in kind of a frozen state for about two weeks and you know, I, we have a whole company, <laughs> right? He's got to depend on me. And so, you know, I, I called him and, and I was just very honest with him. And, uh, and, and I said, listen, I, I'm in this space where this is unusual for me I can't focus I can't concentrate and I'm I'm really trying to find value in the work that I'm doing when this is still happening in the streets um, I'm trying to, to reconcile our partnership if you don't care about this because if, if you're gonna tell me to move on and hey let's just do our work and let's be good in the world and let's do what we're supposed to do and maybe that doesn't happen to us you know, I'm not racist, Rashad. I'm your friend. We're good, right? You know, if I'd had that happen, I, I, like that just wasn't going to work for me anymore. 
And so I had a very real conversation with them. And then I said, listen, if, if you want to be an ally, um, I got a, I got a rec. He loves to read. I got a rec. Here's some books. I'll buy you the books. Let our next few conversations be about that. Right. Cause I have to know who you are in the room because I can no longer just kind of, I can't even work with you if we can't agree on what is a violation of a human right. So there is no moving past it because we're trying to move past it when we can't agree on facts. Is this a violation of a human being's natural, inalienable, equal rights in America? Right. Where, where I, like I fought, I wore a uniform. I didn't wear a uniform too. I didn't wear a uniform also. I wore a uniform. Just like everybody else who wore a uniform wore a uniform, right? For all of these ideals that I believed, I, I believed them. And so it's, it's, it's that much more, it's that much more mentally debilitating because like, I believe this. I want to talk well, like kids this. Mr. <laughs> Howard, but it, it's, it, I, I believe it's still there. I believe it is still there, just like those who came before us believe it was still there that were in segregation, you know, that were free from slavery, but still indentured servants. It's still there because sometimes I feel like, like you were saying, your business partner, what if he just, he read the books, said, yep, is a violation of human rights. I totally agree, but still cannot really understand or see it from your perspective because not everybody's going to agree right i have an answer to that i have an okay. answer to that this time okay. I, if if he's not then we can't be business if he can't see it after these books we right. can't be business partners because i'm not intellectually compatible with this person okay. right so i gave the first book we're reading together is how to be an anti-racist right mm -hmm. i recommend everyone on this on the call read it let me let me tell you something i i've seen this book I've seen this book before. I've seen White Fragility before. I've seen all the books that are on the list of, you know, here's the white person's new guy, <laughs> how to become associated right. with understanding what the hell is going on and what to do about it, right? I've seen them, and here's my thing. I was also arrogant enough to believe, I don't need to race it, uh, to read it. I've had my own traumatic experience. Not try I, don't, I just don't want to get into all that racial stuff because it's too, it's, it's not, you know, Let's just focus on the good, right? That's, that's what I wanted to do. Um, I'm finding that I'm also really uncomfortable stopping to read these books. And so that's probably why I should. And, I, and so I'm reading it too. And um, what I'm finding is a real definition for racist and anti-racist. That there's no such thing as a not racist person. Yeah. That there's no neutral state. Right. And that we sort of toe the line between racist actions and anti-racist actions. So, so I'm saying all these things because at the root of all of this is a different what framework for thinking about the world around you and putting language to what's happening in ways that most of us ignore all the time because, you know, let's just focus on this. It's okay, let's move past. So, but here's the point. If he did not read these books, first and foremost, we, yeah. there's, this is a matter of time. We're not going to be partners. If he reads them and then doesn't, it doesn't materialize, these English words that we're reading together don't materialize, right. then we couldn't be, we, we can't be, we can't be partners. Because I, I can't, I can't work with someone who's not going to do anything about racism. Mm -hmm. I can't. I can only work with someone who's going to be anti-racist most of the time. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like, well, I wouldn't be able to work with someone who's sexist, right? Like, like basically, that's that means they've got something that is, is made potentially harmful to me. It's absolutely harmful, and the thing is, and, and we've spent so many years because of the the sort of prevailing authority, whatever that means anymore. And so I'm questioning everything, by the way. Now, so, so Willie, I'm not I'm not uh, getting on you. I just when you said the words authority, I've always had a problem with authority anyway. <laughs> so. <laughs> so for me, it's just, you know, we're all human beings. What gives one human being authority or rights over another other than 
the system that, that has made it okay for that person who has a gun and the willingness and ability and the protection to use it even against those who are unarmed. That's, that's what that authority means. And so if that's the authority, um, I don't want to respect the authority at all because I don't think it should exist. So I want to dismantle the system that allows for that to be an authority that my children have to grow up believing that they have to kowtow to in some way, shape or form. And so like these, but these are the things like just spending the necessary time feeling the way that I felt and deciding if there's anything that I'm terrified of is passing that on. That's not some, that's not the cultural genetic memory I want to give to my children. And I want to be deliberate about whatever talk I have with them or don't have with them. It just has to be informed by me making a deliberate choice that I'm not going to pass this down just because it was passed down to me. And what I will pass down is something that is commensurate with humanity and life and them being themselves. And I, I won't insert my concern for their safety into their humanity. And, and that's well-meaning as I may be for that. I want my kids to live forever, obviously. I don't even want to die. I want to see them become everything that they want to become and I want to be here for them. But I'm telling you, man, I, I also don't want my son to look at me in my old age and say, and, and remember my interactions um, with authority and, and seeing a different person and believing that he should mimic that. Yeah. Brennan, I see you got your hand up there. I kind of want to start like wrapping it, this up and maybe we can have this conversation uh, again, like a part two in a couple weeks. I, I really think that we're really capitalizing on this. It's awesome. The things that I'm hearing are, you know, that there are heuristics and biases that have become institutionalized almost. Um, and or in many ways have been institutionalized. And there's been some, uh, on all parts, right, on all of us, allowance of that happening. And now we, it's the rise up of, of like, look, this isn't right. And we have got to do something about it. And that doesn't mean that one person does one thing. It means we all do, right? We all have the responsibility to speak up and be our authentic selves so that we can match these on head on. Brennan, um, I'll give you the last words. Um, so I think uh, this this conversation and the the necessary conversation it, it really transcends race. It happens to be about race because that's what we focus on as a society and as a as an oppressor, a victim, or a bystander. Um, but you know the way we've always done it, that, as that was thrown out, I hear that and it makes me cringe outside of any type of uh, discussion about people it's it, and it goes to the mindset we have to change the mindset um, the way we think about all of this um, you know there's there's words that describe a lot of the behaviors that we see that are less polarizing than racism but they stem from it disenfranchised marginalized privilege power distance fragility bias. Those are things that there, there are so many ways that they apply. Um, I, I'm, I'm left-handed. I experience bias on a regular basis. Um, and it's just, it's something that I've had to overcome. You'll hear multiple stories of it. it it's about the human condition. But until we're ready to see each other and our humanity and see each other as humans, we will continue to struggle and we cannot move forward until we make the space and take the time to have these conversations. I love it. I love it. Thank you all so much again for being here and for doing this. And if you are interested in having like a, a sequel, I would be so grateful because this is really powerful, good stuff um, that I think we're talking about. Um, and I love the diversity of our thoughts, right? Like it's been, it's been great. Mm -hmm.